Okay, welcome folks. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you. So many uh, folks that are joining us and, uh, and uh, coming into our, our Zoom meeting here to our end of year celebration. For those of you who have not had the chance to meet, my name is Yvette Monroe and I'm the Assistant Vice Provost of Student Success and I have the distinct honor of being your MC for today's event. For all of our work study students, congratulations to all of you for getting near the end of your academic term and the end of your work study contract. You should all feel a great sense of accomplishment for the usual reasons, such as the ability to juggle your studies and your work study responsibilities, and also the responsibilities that I know many of you also have at home, with your families, at other roles that you play, and in your communities. But you should feel also an extra sense of pride for managing to do so during a time that it was required everyone to be a little bit more patient and ever adaptable, and working at a time that we don't quite know what may or may not be around your corner. Like many of you, I too also started a new job during this time, and I know the extra effort it takes to figure out your way around and to connect with new people. I'm very excited about today's event, both because it is my very first year-end celebration event, and also because it's a wonderful showcase of how work study offers a way to connect work integrated learning and academic learning. We are looking forward to hearing from our panelists and learning how the many skills many of you have gained are transferable to your future career success. Before we get started, I would like to take this time to introduce my colleague, Catherine Solol, Executive Director of Markham Student Services, and invite her to offer our land acknowledgement. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Yvette. Hello, everybody. This meeting is virtual, and because of that, we are not all gathered in the same space. York's land acknowledgement might not represent the territory that you are currently on. And I would ask that if that is the case, that you each take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on and its current treaty holders. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory, this territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon, One Pound Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you for that, Catherine. Uh, at this point, uh, it is my distinct honor also to welcome Lucy Fromwitz, our Vice Provost Students, and invite her to offer some opening remarks. Thank you so much, Yvette. And thank you to everyone uh, to uh, being invited to this event. Truly one of the most exciting events that I experienced during the year. And I'll tell you why. I am such a supporter in our students engaging in work at the university for so many reasons. You not only connect to the community, the research shows it actually builds retention and so many additional skills. So some of you in different positions may think, well, you're an admissions tour guide or you support advising or um, you work in athletics, uh, helping in the training or the setup of equipment, or you support a researcher. But let me tell you what you're actually doing. You're developing this incredible skill set that we hope will carry you through um, not only your academic career here, but throughout your life. You're discovering what excites you and you're discovering what perhaps doesn't. And it's in the reflection of what did I learn this year? You know, if I was working in financial literacy, did I enjoy my interactions with people or am I really discovering about myself that I'm better suited for behind the scenes or project management? Or was I doing a job behind the scenes? But I realized that really I thrive on being upfront and dealing directly with people. This is what you're discovering through the reflection. Honestly, the most important part of your work is that continuous reflection and then the reflection at the end. Also, 
So you're in these positions, but what are you actually learning? You're learning so and developing so many skills, honing them, communications, financial literacy, uh, developing global perspectives. York University has students from, I always get the number wrong because I make it up, uh, 150 or 160 countries around the world and you are interacting with them in your jobs. So you are developing these interpersonal skills on a global perspective. Teamwork, because very few jobs nowadays involve just yourself. Reflective thinking, if you don't know what that is, look that one up. Working across difference. These are the transferable and the critical skills. Yes, if you're, for example, a tour advisor, I picked that one because that was one of my work study jobs quite some time ago. And you think, okay, what did I know? I learned where every building is at York and I know the history of it. But really what I developed was an ability to interact with large groups of people to really understand and listen to what their needs were so that I could conduct that work in a way that meets their needs, not in these standard formats. I have been hiring people for decades. That's kind of hard to say sometime, but for decades. And I can tell you, especially when I'm hiring new graduates, alumni, I have never, ever asked a student, what was your grade point average? But I sure as heck have asked them, how have you contributed to your university? What was the most significant experience you have had? The other thing that sometimes disappoints me and, and quite surprises me is you, our work study students, have done so many important jobs and I look at a resume and I see student and perhaps a part-time job off campus um, whatever that may be and I don't see you putting on that resume the important jobs that you have had as part of work study and it disappoints me because I think that's where some of the most critical learning really happens. So that's why this is the most exciting thing, bringing two programs together, work study, becoming you. This is what that marriage really begets. Now, this program has really progressed so far beyond uh, my imagination. You now have coaches. And what, so Speaking to all you coaches out there, I don't know about you, but this is to me the most exciting part of why I come to work. You know, there's some good aspects to being a vice provost student, and I greatly enjoy the work, but the opportunity to act as a coach or a mentor, to engage in these deeper conversations and to really impact individual student lives is what I go to sleep at night proud of. It's not the 500 meetings I attended or the 38 decisions I made or the 38 decisions I wish I made. It's those one-on-one -on -one interactions where I truly think perhaps I made a difference. The other thing I thrive on is every day I learn something new and I learn it through the interactions. Meeting with a student, I learned so much more about their lives, about what they're bringing, about the complexities that they face. And with each of those experiences, I grow. I understand that world a little bit more. So I am incredibly grateful to all of you who are mentors and our employers and alumni. You came through our program and you thrived. I really look forward to hearing the skills you developed, 
when you were here in work study positions. Um, it, well, obviously important. What you're doing now, I, I'm focused on the journey. How did you go from being the uh, assistant to an advisor or working in the career center or working uh, in counseling uh, or as in health promotions? How did you take what you learned in those positions and transition them? What were your steps that then brought you to where you are now? And I think it's incredibly exciting. So with that, I'm going to wish you a wonderful celebration for our, our students. I know you're about to go into exams. So I wish you great success with your exams. Uh, for those of you who are graduating, great success beyond uh, your studies at York. And for those of you who are returning, I really hope you are also returning to new work study positions because the variety of positions, a thousand of them that are available to you, each one is a growing experience. Each one is a ladder to the next one. What you learn in one, you perfect in the next position. So I wish you great success. Uh, I'm eternally grateful to all the people organizing this work uh, and organizing this celebration. And again, thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you very much, Cece. Thank you for your insights and your words of support and making those very clear connections for us between the relationship between the work study program, learning for our students, for the life of the, the campus and, the, and our university community, and, and thank you for those kind words. I would like now at this point to invite Serena from Career Education and Development to kick off our employer panel. I'm very interested in hearing from our, from our coaches and employers. Thank you so much, Yvette. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Strategies for Getting Hired panel, The Value of Transferable Skills. My name is Serena Sohal. I am the Employer and Alumni Liaison from Career Education and Development, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. Uh, so during today's panel discussion, our audience will have the opportunity to connect with recruitment professionals and learn about the importance of identifying your own transferable skills and get tips on how to succeed in your own job search as well. During today's panel, uh, we do ask that you keep your audio off just during the moderated Q&A so we are free from any interruptions. We will have approximately 45 minutes for discussion. I will start us off with a few uh, job search related questions and then we're going to open up the floor to uh, student and audience Q&A. So today we are really excited to be joined by two accomplished professionals from the recruitment world. Uh, we have here today Jasmine Singh. Jasmine, if you could just give us a wave. Uh, Jasmine is an HR business partner at Longos. Thanks for joining us. And we also have here today Brooke Campbell, who is a talent acquisition manager at Enterprise Holding. So both of our speakers are here to provide you with insights and strategies for finding success in your job search. And we're just so excited to have them join us today. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to to come here and provide our audience with um, the great insights that you're about to provide. So we want to begin our discussion today by asking each of our panelists um, just to briefly tell us a little bit of information about your uh, respective organizations and the role that you play. Brooke, would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hello, everyone. So as mentioned, my name is Brooke Campbell. I'm a talent acquisition manager with Enterprise Holdings. Many of you may know us as Enterprise rent car so we are the largest transportation provider, um, but we are so much more than a car rental company. We recruit and hire for our management trainee position. It's where everyone in our company starts. It's where I started 10 years ago, and it really teaches you valuable hands-on skills across all different facets of the business, customer service, sales and marketing, finance and operations. Um, so it's very entrepreneurial and we promote 100% from within. So I, as mentioned, uh, started my career with Enterprise 10 years ago. I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I had a friend who worked for the company who referred me. I was a management trainee for about nine months and then was promoted to an assistant manager. And then at my two year mark was promoted to a branch manager. 
And then after about a year and a half being a branch manager, the opportunity to join the HR team opened. Um, so when we talk about the transferable skills, I didn't go to school for HR. I never saw myself in human resources. But what I learned from being a management trainee all the way to a branch manager, those transferable skills, allowed me the opportunity to apply and get promoted to the HR team as a generalist. Um, and then most recently for the last three years, I've been responsible for the hiring and recruitment process for enterprise across all different divisions and departments. So, so excited to be here and to talk to you all. And I look forward to the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, and your career journey really shows, you know, what we preach at Career Education Development, where your degree is fantastic, but your degree does not determine what you do, right? So thank right. you again for joining us. Jasmine. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Jasmine and I work with Longos. Longos is a grocery retailer and we are, um, we're in the GTA. And so we have 36 locations. You probably have seen our trucks on the road, either Longos or um, Grocery Gateway, which is our online um, e-commerce platform that really took off uh, during COVID with all the online grocery shopping and delivering that was happening. Um, similar to what Brooke shared, we also, we hire a lot of students, especially in our stores. And so we try really hard to promote within. Um, I know with, we have a lot of job shadowing and even cross training that we do. A lot of, it's really nice to see because a lot of our um, co-op positions or even our coordinator roles, we try our best to fill internally. So it's really nice when um, you're able to see someone that was working as a student student apply what they're learning in school or what they're passionate about um, and apply that then in the corporate um, in our corporate head office so really nice to follow that journey and see them watch and grow and mentor them as well um, and then I guess a little bit about my journey so I've been with Longos for about four years now I have worked in recruitment for a while and um, about two years ago I was promoted and I took on the HR business partner role so I'm doing that and then I've always been really passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that was something I went back to school for two years ago. And at that time, we did not have um, any strategies in place around that. But I'm happy to say that we've recently developed a council and a committee, and we're um, working really hard to try to see how we can incorporate DE&I into our, um, our everyday initiatives that we have. So it's been a great um, learning journey for myself as well. Thanks so much for sharing, Jasmine, uh, and how exciting to be part of an initiative like that. So for our second question, um, we wanted to ask our speakers today, what advice, what specific advice you would give to students about the most effective ways of finding and securing opportunities in today's ever-changing labor market? So are there any specific websites or resources that you can refer students to? Um, and also just to add on to that, how have things changed during the pandemic? So Brooke, I see that your audio is already on. Did you want to tackle this one first? Oh, sure. Um, so my biggest piece of advice for, I get it, you are coming out of university. There's so many job opportunities. It's hard to kind of figure out where you want to see yourself end up. Um, I always tell students, you're way better students than I was coming to events like this and really meeting with recruiters that eventually could hire you in the future or lead you to where you're meant to be. Um, if you don't have LinkedIn, my first piece of advice is to get LinkedIn. LinkedIn is such a great tool to really build your network. You never know when someone, if you connect with myself, for example, that someone within my network will post a job. Maybe it's not enterprise that you end up with, but maybe you end up, you know, pursuing an opportunity with one of my connections. Um, it's also a really great resource when you're interviewing for a company to find alumni that works within that organization, reach out to them. Don't be afraid of, you know, reaching out and being rejected. That's okay. I mean, you're going to have that. And I think that the more people you reach out to in the interview process, the better to get information. Um, but research the organization that you are applying with. Uh, nothing is more frustrating to a recruiter when we ask you, what do you know about our company? And it's minimal. It, the more research you do just shows that you're interested in the opportunity. Every company has a website. So make sure you go there, you do your research. Another really great tool to utilize is Glassdoor. Glassdoor will have um, reviews from current employees, past employees. And then it's also a really good tool to use during the interview process because 
it's so hard to know the questions that you're going to be asked and you want to get prepared. And sometimes, you know, candidates who went through the process will post questions that they were asked. So that's a really good tool as well. But definitely reach out to alumni within an organization. LinkedIn will show all current jobs open. Um, so that's a really great tool. And then throughout the interview process, I mean, Google is going to be your best friend for sample interview questions. And again, to kind of figure out keywords, like if you want to see yourself in sales, Google sales, and that'll put up, pull up all the jobs that are open. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out. I mean, you have two um, HR professionals on this call today, connect with us on LinkedIn, um, reach out, ask questions. I'm here to be a resource for you throughout the interview process. Um, we hire the most York alumni into our organization. So the biggest piece of advice among everything I just mentioned is don't be afraid to reach out and, and really build your network. Fantastic advice. Thank you so much, Brooke. Jasmine, same question. Um, I'm so sorry, can you repeat the question? Of course. Um, so what specific advice would you give to students about the most effective ways of finding and securing opportunities? Um, and then if there's any specific websites or resources that you can recommend, and then if, if at all things have changed during the pandemic? For sure. Um, Brooke, I think you did such a great job at answering that question. So I'll try to see um, what I can add. I think you covered a lot of it. But I would say, um, you know, the, the same like LinkedIn, um, for sure. Sometimes, like Brooke said, um, we post, we'll have, uh, you know, we'll, we'll share jobs even for other departments. Like it might not be um, for HR, it might be for something else. So just keep an eye out, really connect with, follow the organizations that you're interested in um, or you'd like to work at. See, you know, follow them and maybe even it's okay to go go ahead and like reach out to myself or if there's someone else um, in HR to, to follow them and see what are they posting? Who are they following? You know, um, like Brooke said, sometimes that leads to, um, I know for myself, like not so much in terms of jobs, but sometimes with information, I'll see things or I'll see events. Like I'll even see like recruitment events or uh, mentorship opportunities. And, and I'll, you know, it's, it's just really nice to see, or sometimes you'll see that there's someone, you know, that's speaking at an event. And so it's a really nice way to network um, and connect. So that's something that I would recommend. Um, and then of course, like your, your Indeed, your glass door. I know that sometimes we also um, will post on university and college boards, job boards as well. So that's another place to keep an eye out for. Um, and then in terms of, you know, what, what to know or do, I always say, um, as Brooke said, like, look at the company's website, look at what are, what, what are their um, values? What's their mission? You know, what's important to them? How, how did, how were they founded? Um, it's really important to know all of that um, because Longos is so, similar to law of laws, um, I cannot tell you the amount of times that people mix it up and, you know, they'll say, oh, like, yeah, I, I'm really interested in working at law of laws. And it's, it's such a small thing, but it's always um, really good to just do that research and know, you know, where you're going and be a little prepared. Um, that's something that I always share. Your, so this was 10 years ago. I don't know what's offered now at the Career Center at York, but um, I found the workshop so helpful. And I remember there was one I don't know if this is offered anymore but there was something that was offered where um, it was a mock interview and it was recorded and you they played do you still have that yeah okay awesome um that was my favorite thing that I ever did I still use what I learned like 10 years ago even today when I'm interviewing or I'm presenting um it was it was such an I got such great feedback that I use till this day um so one of the things that I remember from that is that I was really serious and I was so nervous. And as a new grad, sometimes you think that, um, you know, because you're going to an interview, you have to be professional and professional means serious. And that's not always the case. And so um, getting that feedback was so nice because I, I remember um, the individual that was working with me shared, she said, you know, you didn't smile throughout the whole thing, like you were so serious. And getting that, that's something that's always stuck with me. So attending those workshops I still use I think it's called the star method if I'm if I remember that correctly like from this is stuff that I learned 10 years ago and I still use even today so I would say really use um, all these resources that you have available for free are they're just such a great way to also um, really work on those interview skills and those job search skills. 
Excellent advice. Thank you so much to the both of you. Um, common theme is research, 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 right? And I, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, LinkedIn, alum, connecting to alumni, um, this is all great advice. And what I really want to put out there is that if as a job seeker, you find that you need some extra support with those pieces, whether it is um, really, you know, um, branding yourself online or whether it is how to connect with employers or alumni, uh, please do know that career education development is here to support you. So as Jasmine mentioned, we do have workshops. Uh, we also do have individual support. So job search advising, career counseling, uh, mock interviews, these are all things that you can get support with as a student and up to two years after graduation. Uh, so definitely take advantage of those resources that are available to you. Um, Jasmine, thank you so much for those plugs. I promise we did not pay her for those. Uh, so I really appreciate you mentioning all the services that you found useful as well. Um, so for our next question, uh, I would like our speakers to um, describe the value of transferable skills. So all, both of you have mentioned this throughout a lot of your responses, uh, but for you, uh, describe the value of transferable skills um, that students will likely have gained during their work study positions that they may not be aware of. And what are some of the key soft skills that you look for in candidates when you're hiring? So Jasmine, did you want to start off this one? Sure. Um, so in terms of, you know, those transferable skills, I think that um, sometimes it's important to look at what is everything that, like, what are you doing? So I remember, um, you know, when I was starting out and I didn't have a lot of work experience, I really I attended some of these workshops and I remember that I um, ended up using a project that I had worked on in one of my courses. Um, I think it was called like creativity and psychology. And I had done this really great project. And because I didn't have a lot of experience, but I wanted to work um, in a specific field, I was able to use what I had learned um, and all the skills that I had gained do completing that project. So things like, you know, working in a group or working in a team, um, meeting deadlines, being creative with um, trying to problem solve. So there were all these skills that I had picked up along the way. Um, and, and because my work experience at that point in time was limited, I was able to use that or looking at volunteer opportunities. Um, you know, is there something maybe over a summer? Did you volunteer? Um, or did you have like a very short term, you know, maybe it was like a two week contract, like really think outside the box to think of what did you do? Or what are you doing? Um, not just it, it's okay, like not everyone, you know, is working or has a part time job. And so really look at what are some other things that you may do where you might have gained these skills. Um, a lot of I remember class work was in group settings. So looking at what are you doing? Um, you know, in that class, you're meeting deadlines, you're working in a fast paced environment, time management, because you're balancing maybe a full course load. Um, and maybe you are volunteering. So really look at all the different things that you're doing and what skills um, you're picking up from there. So I think that would be um, something that I know I used when I was when I was first looking um, for a job. Don't remember the rest of the question. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. I, they're, they're heavy questions. Um, the second part was what key soft skills do you look for in candidates? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think this is like, it goes, so, so two things. One is, it depends on if the role is more um, analytical, I will look at, obviously, you know, you might not have like, um, the intense, like IT skills that we're looking for. But if you've used and you've listed, you know, maybe some programs that you've used, um, like that's, I, it always goes back to the job. Um, always, I always try to tie it back to what are we hiring for? So if you're in an HR role, I know that, um, you know, you're going to be communicating a lot more, you're going to be dealing with team members a lot more. So really, I would always say to look at, um, it, it really depends on what the position is. There might be some roles where, um, you know, you're not commuting, like maybe you're working by yourself. Um, so you're not, there's not a lot of communication that's happening. Um, you're coming in and you're, you know, doing whatever it is and then you're leaving. So really depends on, on the job, I would say. Um, but, but of course, like those, you know, communication skills, interpersonal skills, um, all of that, I think those are fairly common. Uh, but other than that, I, I would say it would depend on the role. That's fair. Thank you so much. Brooke. Yeah, so I think that um, Jasmine did a great job in, you know, speaking to what you learn on campus. And I know Lucy mentioned this as well. And I think it's important to, as Jasmine mentioned, think outside the box and really um, kind of pick, you know, so in every position that you apply for, there's going to be a job posting that's going to list 
the qualifications and the core competencies that the employer is looking for. So um, my piece of advice there, as kind of Lucy mentioned, you know, you may put your part-time job, but it's all the other things that you've done on campus and really tailor your resume to the specific job that you're applying to. I know you might apply to many opportunities, but take that extra few minutes to really tailor your resume um, to the, the certain skills, the soft skills that you've been able to develop that the employer is looking for. Um, so at Enterprise, we for every position that we hire for, we hire based on those soft skills or what we call core competencies. So leadership, um, very similar to what was mentioned, maybe you have a part-time job where you've been a team lead or you have that like supervisor position. Um, even if it's a part-time job, so put that on your resume. Or maybe you take the leadership role in group projects, and that's a really great example as well. Maybe you've been a part of a club or an organization on campus. Those are really great things to put on your resume. Um, for um, We also look for sales ability. I think a lot of times people get intimidated by the word sales, but you are selling yourself in every aspect of your life, whether it's an idea to a family member or a friend, whether it's a case competition that you're trying to convince, you know, for a group project, um, whether it's in an interview or a networking event, you're selling yourself. And so, you know, we, if you're a varsity athlete or you're competitive, like those are all sales abilities that we look for. Um, and then customer service. And that kind of goes with communication and professionalism. So anytime you've been able to develop those customer service skills where you've had a part-time job or a full-time job, um, where you've dealt with the public, you've been in a customer service position, like those are all really great things to talk about. Um, but it's just knowing, you know, the things that you've done on campus in a part-time or full-time job, um, maybe you volunteer, like those are all really great things to put on your resume. Your resume is really what's going to help you set yourself apart from every other candidate. So the more you can really tailor your resume, the more soft skills or transferable skills that we're looking for that you can put on, um, the better. Because some companies use like an applicant tracking system where they're looking for those keywords. We don't at Enterprise, but some companies do. And if you don't put those on there, you may not get a call. So it's really important to tailor your resume to the job posting that you're applying to um, and take that extra couple of minutes to really sell yourself on your resume. If, um, if you do a cover letter, like changing the company name, I've had resumes and cover letters come to me that are addressed to a different company. Again, this is your first opportunity to make a great impression. I think yeah, one sorry. thing I'll, I'll add to what Brooke was um, sharing was that it's also okay to, um, you know, add something that you're passionate about. So maybe I remember one time I interviewed someone and um, this individual in, in their free time, they fixed computers. Like it was just something they, they did for fun. They were very passionate about it. Um, and it was for an IT support role. And so, um, you know, I, I remember like I, that always sticks out to me because um, that's not something a lot of times I've seen on resumes or even people talk about, but, but I think that's a great thing to add on there. If there's something you're passionate about that relates to the role that you're applying to like maybe you're really passionate about um, reading books and you're applying to I'm just you know thinking aloud but like to a library a, a role in a library um, or a community center or if you're really passionate about like painting and then you're applying to maybe work with kids and, and do arts and crafts and things like that it's, it's okay um, to add I think it's a great great thing to do to add that in there so um, always important to kind of think outside the box and look at everything that you're doing Excellent advice. Thank you to the both of you. So really, it comes down to like learning about yourself, right? And really understanding what it is that you bring to the table. Uh, for anyone in the audience that may need some extra support with that, please know that we do have career counseling available. Um, and this is the best way for you to learn more about the skills that you do have and be able to not only identify them, but also articulate them as well. Um, I also wanted to add just two things here as well. We talk about soft skills a lot. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention is, yes, follow the advice that's provided to you and tailor your resume and really include those hard and soft skills. 
but especially when including those soft skills, um, understand what that means for you. Many times we may say we have excellent communication skills or great interpersonal skills, but the minute you're asked to provide some evidence or an example, um, that's where the struggle comes into play. So going back to what Jasmine mentioned before about the STAR formula, I'm going to send a resource into the chat for that as well. Uh, but really having, really having that evidence and really having that story of when you've demonstrated that is very important. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, our next question, and we're, we're down to our last two questions. We're going to be opening up the, um, the, the floor to student Q&A in about, I would say about 10 minutes or so. So any questions that you have, feel free to add them into the chat right now, or you can use the raise hand function to uh, raise your hand and ask the question live. So our next question is about networking. So both of you have mentioned the importance of making connections um, and it's like, you know, connecting to alumni, connecting to recruiters. Uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about ways that students can go about making those networking connections. Um, you know, what, what advice do you have in terms of, you know, what to do and what not to do when networking? Yeah, uh, for sure. I think, I mean, networking, the more you can get comfortable with networking early on, the better. I, I've been able to, um, you know, build a successful career solely by networking and building relationships with department heads, with you know, upper management with general managers to kind of build that relationship. So when I'm interviewing, I've already had that relationship built with them. So the more you can do to it, I know it's intimidating sometimes and it's uncomfortable, but it's really important to be comfortable feeling uncomfortable. And so reaching out and building those connections. Um, I know I said this earlier, but by coming to events like this and really meeting with recruiters and, um, you know, resources within York. I think that that's where you start. So you guys have already done that. Um, I know we talked about LinkedIn. So just reach out to alumni. Again, you can reach out to myself on LinkedIn. Um, I've had so many coffee chats with students. Um, I've done mock interviews, things like that. I know that um, you have so many great resources available to you from, you know, your school and career services and, that is so amazing because I definitely didn't take advantage of that when I was in school. Um, so make sure that you do. I know that the STAR method was mentioned. And when we do interviews, we always ask behavioral interview based questions. Tell me about a time when. And that's really for you to showcase the time where you did that transferable skill, because typically that's going to translate to the fact that you can do that in the job that you're applying to. So the STAR method is how you answer those behavioral interview-based questions. So that's an amazing resource. Um, I would say, you know, reach out, send a message. Again, don't be afraid of rejection. Um, I would allow time for them to follow up. Sometimes I get, you know, a lot of messages like back to back to back if I haven't responded. Sometimes my LinkedIn is overflowing. I would just say give a little bit of time for them to reach back. Um, it's good to follow up, but I think sometimes when we follow up too much, it might not be the best. Um, but I would just say, like, don't be afraid of rejection. Reach out to connections on LinkedIn. Um, go to networking events. Find a mentor. Like, those are all really great things that you can do if you know where you want to see yourself. The more people you can connect with in that industry who've done the role that you're applying to the better because that's just going to help you build that confidence that you're going to need in an interview to really be able to sell yourself so networking is so important at every stage in your personal and your professional life for sure thank you so much brooke and jasmine same question about networking um and then any jasmine's also a taste mentor as well so i know you've had a lot of experience connecting with your students um so any advice that you have would be great yeah, for sure. Um, I was going to say taste is like such a great way to connect with um, mentors and even for myself just to connect with students. I think I've kept in touch with a lot of the students that um, I have met through there on LinkedIn. And I know recently there was a student that reached out about a job opportunity. So I think that's such a great way um, to connect. Um, through these networking events. And I, I have students that I've met in the past, maybe two or three years ago. Um, there's one student that reaches out to me like every, I would say like six months just to check in. And it's such a nice way to keep that relationship going. And I always remember, you know, she'll just remind me that 
she'll say, this is what I'm doing now, um, but I'm, st I'm still really interested in HR. And so it's always nice because then when someone asks me, for example, you know, either at, at Long Goals or at another organization, um, you know, when someone lets me know that they're looking for maybe an HR coordinator or, you know, a marketing specialist, I remember that there was this individual that I've, I've met and that's interested in this and then I can, you know, um, help them connect. So I think that's a really great way, like all these networks working events. I know that um, since COVID, a lot of the events have shifted to online platforms. And so, um, you know, it's great to attend those and sign up for them. It's also really great. Um, I know that sometimes, for example, at Longos, because we have a lot of students working in our stores, a lot of part-time students, um, you know, sometimes it, depending on where you're working, say you, you have a part-time job and you're interested in working in a different department, um, you know, maybe reach out, maybe like, like speak to your boss or your supervisor and find out um, what are some ways that they that maybe they can help you network and connect with others in the company that may be able to help. I think that's um, a really great way for people to know that you know you're interested in something and you're wanting to grow and learn. And so um, I've seen it happen several times where we've needed support in a certain department for like three weeks, and then we've been able to we look we we look to see you know is there anyone that anyone knows in the company that that is interested in this, any students that are working casual or part-time opportunities um, that are looking for that experience. So I think just um, being open and my boss always says this thing, she, sa she says, you have to keep it real. And so, you know, just let people know that this is what you're looking for and this is what you wanna do. Um, and you never know where that might take you. I think also, um, I know for myself, like when I was a student, I remember reaching out to my family and friends. Um, I didn't know anyone that worked in HR. So, and I wanted to work in HR. So I reached out to my family and friends and there was someone that um, had a friend that worked in HR and I was able to meet with them and just ask them questions and um, get to know more about their role and what they do. So um, yeah, a lot of, I would say everything that Brooke mentioned um, as well. I think she had some great tips there for sure. So yeah. Wonderful advice, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, I have added some resources based on what both of you mentioned as well. Um, and the, the main thing that I just wanted to add on to everything that you said is going back to that research aspect, right? So researching and really preparing yourself. Um, the main thing to remember when doing informational interviews and connecting with alumni and professional in your field um, is that the, the accountability is on you uh, to organize those events, to really take the onus and you know um, schedule the meetings and follow up with people as well. So um, you're going to be the one leading that interview. So it's important for you to be prepared as well. But thank you so much. So for our final question for the moderated piece, um, I'd like to ask both of you to really think back to the candidates and applicants that you've come across. Uh, and if you could let us know, what would you say has distinguished those candidates or applicants who succeeded in the various stages of the recruitment process from those that did not? So what made those that succeeded successful? Jasmine, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I thought about this. Um, I think about this often because um, I remember a lot of the tips that I learned when I was um, doing all these workshops at York and they're still all true even today. So oftentimes they're such small things like I will sometimes I've had resumes where, um, you know, I there's no phone number, the phone number is wrong, or the email isn't correct. And so it's really difficult um, for me to get a hold of this individual that I really want to um, speak to and learn more about. So it's, it's these it's these small things, but they're such big things. So it's always making sure that your resume is up to date, that your contact information is at the top where, um, you know, it's easily viewable and, it, and it's, it's big and it's clear and it's correct. And if you change your number, then, you know, make sure that you've updated that on there. Um, I think another one is like sometimes I get resumes that are 12 pages long. I've seen that or like six pages long. And so really important to make sure that, that document is, you know, I, I think I, I remember learning like around two pages and um, that that's what it should be. But um, even if you have to go over, just make sure that the information you're putting in there is relevant information and, um, you know, that it's consistent. So, um, and, and that it's not six pages long because that's that's a lot for us to look at. Um, I think another one is researching. This has come up so much already, but um, if you're applying somewhere, um, even before I go to research, I would always say if you've applied somewhere and you're applying to a bunch of jobs, 
I always say that it's really important to save a job posting somewhere and make a note that you've applied to that job because there's been times where I've reached out um, and said, you know, I'm calling from Longos, calling in regards to this job opportunity that you applied for. And the person will say that um, they don't remember, they've been applying to a bunch of jobs, they don't remember, can I remind them what the job was. Um, so really important to just, I, I, I used to do this, I would make a note, um, you know, on my computer of all the jobs that I applied to, um, and try to save a job posting if you can, because then when you are doing a pre-screen, or you're even going in for an interview, um, you know what you've applied to, but also it'll help you formulate any questions that you may have, um, or, any, or maybe there's something you're not sure of, and you want to find, learn more about, um, I think that's a great tech strategy, um, I would say, and then I would say researching. So like I had said in the beginning, um, you know, read about the company, read about their mission, their vision, their values, um, know all of that. And it can then help you like use that information to help you when you're in the interview and you're answering questions and tie it back to the vision, mission and values. It really shows us that you've done your research and, um, you know, you, you've looked into it and you know what you're talking about. And it's OK to say like, we're not expecting you to come in and know everything that we're asking you it's okay to say you know I haven't dealt with that situation in the past but if I this is how I would handle it so walk us through um show us what you would do and that shows us your problem solving ability and just um how you're critically thinking and thinking on your feet so um you know, it's okay that you don't have experience doing or you're not able to answer whatever question it is that we've asked. Um, but it's always good to say, you know, but this is what I would do. Um, or this is a similar situation. And I think I can use some of the learnings here and then share um, what that was. So those are some some of the tips that I have. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And Brooke, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Jasmine just said. I think that um, you know, she mentioned doing your research. I think both of us have said that many times um, throughout this panel, but that is so important. And to go one step further, we understand you're going to apply to so many opportunities, but instead of applying to 100 opportunities that are out there, my biggest piece of advice to you is when you're doing your research, as Jasmine mentioned, and you read the values and the mission of the organization, if that doesn't align with your personal values, don't apply for it. And, and you want to work for somewhere where your values align with the company, because that's going to shine in an interview. If you can say, you know, I applied to this opportunity because, you know, for us, we're passionate about giving back to the community. And if they, that's something that they're passionate about, that just aligns very nicely. And it's a great conversation. Um, I actually just had a phone call today, an interview where I called someone and they we're like, oh, what I applied to so many opportunities, like tell me what enterprise does or what was this position I applied for exactly what Jasmine just said, that is not your best first impression. So again, know when you're interviewing with different companies, if you have an interview at 9am, you know, tomorrow, write down the company that it is with and have your research available. Um, that's so important. And I think that that is when I look back on the candidates that have been successful, it's the ones that, you know, their values align. It's the ones that, you know, are looking for a career that we can offer them, that that aligns as well. Um, and then also, um, you know, that they've been confident and they've been able to demonstrate in an interview those transferable skills. And exactly to what Jasmine said, if you don't have an, ex an, an example of a time where you did the the you know question that we're asking think outside the box again and kind of related to those transferable skills that you've been able to build maybe you haven't had exact sales experience but maybe you won your case competition or maybe you were an athlete and you're competitive and you're you know goal oriented those are all really good things to showcase in an interview and then it just goes back to knowing the job that you're applying to and what they're looking for I always write down questions that I think that they're going to ask, even if it's not the exact question, it'll be some sort of variation, customer service, sales, leadership, and just have your examples so you know and you feel confident and that's really going to help set you apart from everyone else that applies that confidence piece. 
excellent, excellent points. Thank you both so much um, and right on time. So I wanted to now open up the discussion uh, to questions from our audience. So students, coaches, uh, if anyone has questions for our speakers today, now would be the time. You can use the reactions button at the bottom to raise your hand. Um, and if nothing else, and you just wanna make a comment and say, thank you, this is also your opportunity. Uh, both of our speakers have mentioned that you know they're open to connecting with people, but they've also mentioned that they get bombarded with messages. So this is a really great way for you to make that connection and engage with them as well. So um, I'd like to open up the floor now. I'm just going to give it a few seconds and see if there are any other questions. You both have done such a wonderful job just providing so much information. Thank you so much. Okay, so I don't see any questions at this time. So I'm just gonna throw out one last question here. This is always a fun one. Uh, we talked a lot about you know, what to do and the advice that you have when it comes to recruitment. Um, would you be able to tell us some of the common mistakes and red flags that you've seen in applications that you would like students to avoid? Yeah, definitely. I, um, you know, when Jasmine mentioned making sure that your resume is up to date with your your current contact information i think it's also a great opportunity for you to do a little bit of a self-reflection if you've had the same email address since you were a teenager i've seen really unprofessional email addresses so maybe it's a it's a great time to update that to use your school email address um spell check do a grammar check send your resume to a family member or a friend to proofread for you um, because spelling and grammatical errors, I mean, that's again, your first impression. Um, and then we live in a virtual world right now. So test your technology. A lot of your interviews are going to be virtual, probably the first one as well, or maybe a phone interview. Um, make sure you're in a quiet area. I've interviewed, um, I always use this example. I once interviewed someone who was it was virtual and they were in bed, like literally under the covers, like that is not the greatest first impression. And just make sure your background is, um, you know, if you're in your bedroom because that's a quiet place in your house, like make sure your bed's made, like all those things that maybe you don't think of that again, will just help you set yourself apart. And when we talk about that professionalism piece, um, and then I would always, prefer to be overdressed and underdressed. Just know when you're in an interview, you, again, that's your first impression. If you don't know what to wear, always overdress and underdress, or it's okay to reach out to the recruiter and ask what the dress code is. Again, that is your first impression when you walk in the door. And then also when you walk in the door, that is when the interview starts. So if you go to a front desk and you meet with an administrative assistant who's going to help you, you're selling yourself from that very point. When I used to do interviews, I always asked, you know, our administrative assistant, like, what was your first impression? And if you don't say hi, you don't smile, that's not a great first impression. So just remember when you walk in the door, that's your first impression and you always want to be on time. So those are just a few of the things that I've come across over the last, you know, several years of doing this that I always like to share because some people, it, it might not be common sense for everyone and that's okay, but whatever we can do to provide these resources to you is going to help you in the process. Excellent advice. Jasmine, I'll get you to tackle that question as well. And I see two sure. other questions in the chat. Sure. Um, Brooke, I think, you know, you, you touched on some really key things there. Um, a lot of what I was, I was thinking or what I've seen as well on resumes. Um, I think the one other thing I will add is, um, again, just make sure, you know, dates on there. Um, sometimes I'll see, you know, you just want to make sure it's consistent, right? So if you have, um, you should be putting dates on there. So if you're working somewhere and it was a part-time job and you're not working there anymore, you know, really, really want to make sure that's updated. Um, if you're currently in school and you're not done yet, you know, we want to make sure that um, that's clear and we can see that it's in progress. Um, so really just make sure that your resume is accurate and also that it's consistent. I think that's a really important one. Um, the biggest thing I know that I, uh, I still use when I'm presenting or I'm going into an interview is I know that a lot of times it can be really nervous. It's, it's an interview, right? It's a big deal. And so really just, I always, I do this for myself and I always encourage like when I'm mentoring others and they have interviews, um, take a few minutes before the interview and just work on like maybe grounding yourself and it's okay to pause. Like it's okay when you're in the interview to just pause for a minute and take a deep breath. 
You don't always have to rush to answer the next question. It's totally okay if you need a few seconds to just gather your thoughts. Um, and it's okay to say like, you know, I, I appreciate when people say, you know, I just need a few minutes to gather my thoughts. Is it okay if we take a couple seconds um, because yeah, it can be a really nerve wracking process. Even though I've been interviewing for so long, whenever I have an interview, I still get nervous. So it's, it's a normal thing that happens that we feel anxious or whatever it is. So I would say spend a few minutes before you enter. Um, I know nowadays, it's, you know, a lot of interviews have moved to Zoom or, or online. So still take a few minutes to just ground yourself and be in your space and be confident. Um, practice research practice you know your your key examples that you uh, might be sharing those are some some tips that I that I have thanks so much okay so I see four questions in the chat we have four minutes left so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to present the question I'll get one of you to address it and if you could answer in about 30 seconds that, that'll be your challenge for today um, okay so first one that we have here is um what advice would you give to someone to overcome the lack of experience issue if they feel that they may be lacking the required amount of experience? Yeah, so I can quickly answer that. I think that just goes back to those transferable skills. In, in university, I mean, you all went to school for four years. Maybe you did something prior. Just think of those skills that we're looking for. Again, if you're the team lead in a in a project, if you've done a case competition, if you've been involved, it doesn't have to be work experience. It can also be volunteering. It also can be, you know, roles that you've had on campus and group presentations. Um, I don't think that you should not apply, but if you don't have the transferable skills that we're looking for, um, then maybe it's not the right opportunity. But again, it just goes back to those transferable skills and being able to you know, sell that you built these skills, maybe not from work experience, but from on-campus experience. Great advice, thank you. Our other question that we have here is uh, to do with resumes. So um, this individual has gotten kind of mixed reviews of do you put everything on your resume of everything that you've done or do you only put relevant job experience? I think we have answered this, but Jasmine, did you wanna maybe tackle this one? Um, yeah, so I would always say to put your your work experience, um, if there is so much of it, you know, that like, say you, have I don't know, had like 10 jobs or something, then you want to put the most recent ones, I would say, um, those are like the key ones you want to focus on. And then anything else you can kind of, um, there's different ways that I've seen it on resumes. As, and I and I don't want to say like, do it this way or do it that way. But um, I think just try to stick to like, put what's relevant. Um, but you also want to make sure that your resume is an ac accurate um, reflection of what you've been doing over the last little bit. So um, yeah, include volunteer and in, include maybe, you know, like, uh, if you're some, really passionate about something, I always say it's important to include that. But at the same time, want to make sure that you're not going overboard, and then it's not turning into like a four page document. Great advice, thank you. Uh, our next question that we have here is, and this is a common thing for a lot of job seekers, is applying to roles that require more experience or skills than they actually have. Um, so the student is wondering, is it redundant effort or should we apply anyway? So any advice for that? So, lack of experience, sorry? Correct, lack of experience and perhaps not meeting all of the skills required. Yeah, so um, again, it's, thinking outside the box and and really relating and looking for those transferable skills I think that there's there's no harm in applying for an opportunity the worst case is that you don't get the opportunity and that's okay you know apply to the next job um, it's such a competitive recruitment landscape right now where there's a lot of organizations looking for people so um I think apply, but again, you really want to do your research and make sure it's a company that aligns with what you're looking for and be very strategic in the companies and the positions that you're applying to. Um, I think it's always better to apply to those opportunities that you really want versus applying to many opportunities. Um, and don't be afraid of rejection. I'm a firm believer that the right opportunity will present itself to you at the right time. I live by that. I've, I've been rejected, but it's all led me to where I am today. So I would say again, apply if it's something that you really want and then find, like build that network. And if it's something, you know, at least you can speak to the fact that you, you've met with an individual from, you know, that industry and you've been able to have that as a mentor or them as a mentor, all those things are really great to help you in the interview process. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Jessica, I see that you did write a question into the chat. I'm not ignoring it, I promise, but I think it's going to be addressed during our alumni panel. Uh, so if you just want to hang on tight. All right, so um, this brings us to the end of our employer panel. Our intention for today's session was really to provide our audience with the opportunity to connect with HR professionals and gain advice and insights about strategies for getting hired in your field of interest. And I think our speakers did a phenomenal job. Uh, we trust that you found this information and advice uh, helpful. And if you do have any other questions about any of the resources that I mentioned, you can always message me directly. If I can just get you to join me in thanking our panelists for being here today, um, either by using your reactions or just writing comments into the chat, that would be wonderful. Uh, and we are going to move on to our next activity very shortly. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I have to say that was fantastic. They, they gave such great insights about how to make those connections between work study, getting involved in university life, the academic experience to build those the, the success for different careers. That was wonderful. And I'm going to say, I took a lot of takeaways. Keep those LinkedIn profiles updated. Do the research. I mean, whether or not that is for looking for your first job after you graduate or, you know, a job in your 50s, like for me, it's, it's absolutely relevant um, and very practical skills. And, and I will say, Jasmine piqued my interest in the STAR method. I might have to follow up and learn more about that. So that was wonderful. I hope um, our, 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 uh, all those attending you know, learned something from that today. And that was a really wonderful session. Now, so now for something actually quite fun and interactive, and we hope we have a little bit of fun with this. Thanks to the C, uh, the Career Education and Development team for thinking very carefully about the, uh, the agenda for today and how to make it interactive and engage our coaches and students. So we have a bit of a fun exercise, which is essentially a word cloud Mentimeter exercise. And I invite folks to essentially go to the appropriate, I think it's gonna be in the chat, correct? Yes. In the chat, you're going to find where you should go, whether or not you are a coach or whether or not you are a student to participate in the Mentimeter word cloud exercise. And let's see, drum roll, what that generates. So I invite folks to go ahead and do that now, please. I love seeing how the words change. Engaging, rewarding, oh wow. Is this combining both the coach and the student? No, this oh, that's an interesting topic. exercise. I think this is just a coach right now. I, I'll be very curious to see what our students, how the words are different from the students. I'll leave this up for another 10 seconds or so. Game changer, I see game changer. Humbling. Definitely rewarding. And that's wonderful to hear from our coaches that they, they found that rewarding. You know, for us, uh, bec being, being a becoming you coach, we know uh, is, you know, a, a special role that our coaches play above and beyond what they already do at York. And so it's wonderful to get that feedback that they also find that rewarding. And Serena, now do we take a look at the, the student Mentimeter word cloud? Yep, sorry, just give me one second here. Sorry, wrong one. Take your time. There you go. Ah, okay. All right, because because they, they theirs was done at around the same time. Also, very interesting that rewarding and meaningful 
uh, really popped up, but I, I see some different words like educational, uh, affectionate. That's that's an interesting one. <laughs> that one stands at learning experience. Uh, thankful. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that feedback. This is lovely and wonderful to see. So, so great to see that. And I always, Bob's heard this story too many times, but I'll share it with this group, which is, you know, I was a first generation immigrant student who started my my under, um, undergraduate studies at York in 1987. And sadly, unlike many of you who are much better prepared and much more uh, uh, clued in, I had no idea that work study jobs existed on campus. I don't know why I didn't know that considering there were lots of people probably my age that seemed to be working all over campus, but it just didn't occur to me. Uh, and so pro um, programs like Becoming You, the work of CED and, and the integration of work study with Becoming You are really, really critical so that we don't have students who ended up like, who started off like me, who didn't, I shouldn't say ended up like me, who, who started off like me uh, and, and not knowing their way around. So great work for that for everybody. Oh wait, all right, now I'm going to pass it back on to Serena who's done, doing a fantastic job as our moderator uh, to introduce our alumni panel. Thank you, Yvette. So hello every, again, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Career Conversations panel, recognizing and articulating your transferable skills. So during this panel discussion, you will once again have an opportunity to connect with our speakers, who are all York alumni. You'll be able to learn about their career journeys and the transferable skills that they gain during their own work study positions at York. Speakers will share advice on how students can begin preparing for life after graduation by providing tips, resources, and insights. We once again have 45 minutes for discussion, so we'll follow the same format. I'm going to start us off by asking our speakers a few career-related questions, and then we'll open up the floor to take questions from the audience. This time, I would like to ask you if you do have questions for our speakers, if you can type those into the chat ahead of time, uh, we can just make sure that we have enough time to address them as well. Uh, so today, we are really excited to be joined by three accomplished alumni. We have here, um, if I could just get you to wave as I say your name, um, Althea. Welcome, Cindy. Welcome, and Lexna. Thanks for joining us. So our three alumni are here to provide you with insights and strategies for finding careers and resources as current York students and new graduates. So without any further delay, I'd like to ask our speakers to begin by just taking a quick minute or two to introduce yourself. Briefly tell us about your current role and your key responsibilities within your current organization, um, as well as the work study position that you held at York. Lexna, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Lexna. Um, I'm the Web and Communications Coordinator for uh, the Division of Students, but more specifically for Career Education and Development. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is around uh, generating communication strategies, social media strategies, um, also doing stuff for the web, so website redevelopment projects and the like. Uh, while I was a student at York, I was actually working for a career education and development as the graphic design and multimedia assistant. Um, a lot of the work that I was doing then was similar to what I'm doing now, but uh, a little less intense. So uh, generating social media graphics, uh, working with my coach to um, revitalize really the brand of CED and also um, starting the Instagram channel, which was a really fun project as well. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Thanks so much. Althea, would you like to go next? Absolutely, thank you. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see everyone's smiling face and some of my coaches and my students in here, so hi. Um, my name is Althea, my pronouns are she and her. My official role at York is the Student Success Coordinator. Um, but really, really, that means that I help coordinate some academic support initiatives across labs. Um, some things that you might be familiar with are PASS, our peer-assisted study session program. Um, but I also work on really cool projects like the IM Mentoring and Tutoring Program, which is something that we're working on with high school students who are uh, Black youth in foster care um, and helping them discover pathways to education. So. I love my job, very interesting role for a very non-interesting name, um, but that's what I do at York. Um, and I held various positions while at York. So I've kind of hopped around a lot when I was an undergrad. I started working at the Faculty of Health as a leadership coordinator. And basically that meant that I helped out with York Orientation Day, which I hope most of you are familiar with. 
Um, and then I also had the pleasure of working at the Student Community and Leadership Development Department, so SCNLD. And I worked at the, you know, the Google in the middle of Very Hall. That's where I was for many years. And I also worked with UStart. So that's a very quick summary of my, my jobs at York. Thank you so much. Cindy. Hi, everyone. So my name is Cindy, and I graduated from New York in 2018 with two degrees. So I always thought I was going to be a teacher, so I decided to pursue a major in primary education and digital media. But halfway through university, I realized that I didn't want to be a teacher anymore, and I had no idea how I was going to pivot my career. I remember the summer before my final year, I saw a classmate post a work-study position on Facebook that he previously held. So I reached out to him asking him more about the role and he ended up interviewing me with the director of CED at the time. And I landed the role and I had a chance to work with Vishnavi, who I believe Luxna has also worked with her during when she was a work study student. And I would say that this role has led me to, it has catapulted my career essentially. And now I'm working as the Marketing and Communication Officer at Rotman at the University of Toronto. And in this role, I lead their digital marketing strategy. I help them create content for their social media channels. And I'm also managing my own work-study students now. So it's a little surreal to give back. And we're also doing an exciting campaign with the Toronto Raptors. They're planning to launch a scholarship for Black and Indigenous students. So I'm really excited about that. And it's nice to see you, Serena, because I know we worked together when I was a work-study student. It's wonderful to have all of you here. Uh, you could probably tell from the big smiles on all of our faces that we are just so proud of all of you for what you've accomplished. And we are just so happy that you're able to join us today and really inspire our current work study students as well. Um, so on that note, we'd love to hear from you about what role your work study experience at York played and participating in becoming you. Um, how, how did that all play into your journey? Anyone that would like to tackle that first? Just go ahead and turn your audio on. Um, I can go ahead. Okay. Uh, so my work study experience at York was really integral, I think, to the confidence that I've gathered today. Like, I, I wouldn't, if you asked me back then if I'd be doing a panel right now for Becoming You, I probably would be like, oh, no, I'm not going to be doing that in the next few years. But here I am, right? Um, so definitely the confidence that I've been able to gather um, another really big thing that I sort of took from Becoming YU and I still continue today is learning how to do active reflections. Um, I, I remember in Becoming You, one of the uh, first things that we do is really assessing the skills that you have right now and seeing where you're at um, to, you know, pick and choose the skills that you want to develop while you're in your work study role. That is something that I still do with myself today, just because, you know, it's important throughout your, your career is your whole life, really, right? It's important to continue reflecting on, you know, what do you want to develop? Um, is there something that you've developed and you're proud of? Like, I don't think we take the enough time to reflect on our accomplishments as well. And that's something that I learned from Becoming You. Um, I remember uh, doing the last, uh, the final check-in, I was just like, wow, it's, actually really cool to see how far I've gotten um, in the uh, the time that I was working with Vaishnavi and Vaishnavi was such an awesome coach as well so being able to sit down with someone and like take away some time in your day to just you know reflect on where you're at where you want to go and um, where you see yourself uh, in the future that's something that I've definitely taken from the workstay program and uh, continue with today um, another thing that I really learned from uh, my work study role was uh, while I was in school, I thought I was really confined to um, what my degree uh, sort of entailed. So I went to do uh, the design program at York and Sheridan. I don't think it exists anymore, but uh, I think it's just the design program at York right now. And so I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just be a designer. But then I there were points in my student career where I was like, I feel like I'm kind of being boxed in and I know I have some skills that I'd like to apply elsewhere. Um, and Vaishnavi really showed me that, yeah, you're great at you know analyzing data or coming up with strategies. And I'm like, 
yeah, but that's not really something that was addressed while I was in school. And she's like, no, you could still do those things. You don't have to be confined to what your degree is. So um, that was a really uh, integral part of um, becoming you for me as well. Curious to hear from the other alumni, though. So well said, Lexna. I just messaged my, my Schnabi to ask her if she's crying yet, because she definitely will be soon. <laughs> um, okay, Cindy, would you like to go next? Sure. So what is really cool about my current role is that I find that I'm using all the technical skills that I learned during my work-study position. So when I was a work-study student, I learned how to use all the different software under Adobe Creative Cloud. I learned how to do event photography for like the career fair, how to create a content calendar for social media, how to create videos for the higher sector, because now I find myself editing so many Instagram reels for U of T. And speaking of video editing, I was actually part of the pilot program for Becoming YU. So I helped them create the Expressing YU videos for YouTube. So it sort of feels like a full circle now that I'm back on this panel and talking about this program. And besides the technical skills, I feel like I also learned the soft skills. Um, I learned how to work cross-functionally in a company and how to manage stress under tight deadlines, which I feel like I'm still doing today in my current role. And what I like about Vishnavi was that she was just as involved as I was with the Becoming YE program. This meant that she knew what my goals were and she was always assigning me projects that align with my learning outcomes. So I highly recommend that you talk to your manager or supervisor about your goals, just so that you guys can work together towards reaching them. And I found that the Becoming YE program really made my work study experience much more valuable. And I think that's it for my end. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Althea. Thank you. Um, I, th I think I'm just gonna piggyback on both of your points, but I was really sneaky with my Becoming You check-ins and I'll, I'll explain why. <laughs> um, but I had some really phenomenal coaches who sat with me and talked regularly with me about my life goals, the skills that I thought I was really good at um, and my educational goals. Cause I was for context in my third year or second year in psychology, didn't wanna pursue psychology. I was really good at it but I did not want to do it anymore. So I was kind of just, okay, I'm going to finish this degree and figure it out from there. So the reason why I was sneaky was because I actually used those uh, check-in moments as a mentorship session. So I was like picking their brain. I'm like, okay, what should I do with my life? Where can I go with all of these random skills that I've picked up through all of these jobs? Um, and so my coaches really helped me reflect on my own leadership and help translate those into things that I wanted to improve on. And I'll give an example. I really had a lot of experience on leadership uh, sessions and trainings. And I know that when I was in a position to lead other students in those team lead, thank you, Seba, <laughs> in those team lead roles, um, I wanted to make training that was fun and engaging, but also, you know, piqued my interest with group dynamics that I learned from psychology, but also, you know, build a really strong foundational team. And so I went up to my supervisor at the time. I'm like, hey, I want to make training really, really cool, but I want to make it fun. And I want to make sure that this team is unbreakable. And she's like, okay, Althea, if you think you can do that in one week, go ahead. And so that was my huge kind of project that I had to do. And I did it, but I really was only able to do it because I had a coach who understood kind of all the components and intersectionalities of my education with my goals and my like maybe hobby of leadership development that I didn't understand kind of how those intersected. Um, and that was actually really crucial, the fact that I had coaches who knew me so well, because when I ended up going into grad school, so plot twist, I ended up getting an MED, um, a master's of education. I actually had really, really bad imposter syndrome and I had no idea why. And I was like super nervous all the time and just, just so intimidated with the people in my class. Um, and I really had my coaches to connect back with. I'm like, hey, do you remember me? I was that really overly confident undergrad and now I'm so not confident right now. I don't know what I'm doing here. And they were really able to kind of give me the confidence that, that I needed at the time um, and just kind of reflect back and say like, remember that time that you did this? This is super transferable to what you're doing now in grad school. And that cheerleading moment, again, very sneakily and selfishly kind of those seeds were planted um, very early on that really helped me su to succeed even now in my professional career. Excellent, thank you so much. Yeah, no, I wouldn't call that sneaky. I would call that strategic, most definitely. Um, thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to say <laughs> that, that one, for sure. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, no, that, that was amazing. You, all three of you are so inspirational. I mean, I feel like crying. I can only imagine what your coaches feel like right now, but you guys, you guys are amazing. Um, what advice and resources do you have for students who are looking to prepare for graduation? Um, you know, in your, in, in your opinion, what should they be doing? What skills should they be gaining or improving? Someone would like to start us off? Uh, I okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I think this goes for most things in life, but always do your research, right? So in my particular case, I didn't know what field I wanted to go to or kind of what skills I needed. So even kind of shopping around the different areas that I was able or kind of qualified maybe to go into, those were the skills and assets that I needed to make sure that I had experience in um, and really honed in as, you know, whatever work, work study position I was holding. Um, and on top of that, your volunteer experiences and your research experience, however that compounds. Um, so it was really important that I knew the general transferable skills that I can take from each of those roles and perhaps put into, you know, a solid job description that I was interested in. Um, you'd be surprised at how things translate between sectors and fields and also kind of volunteer experiences into work experiences. So just knowing kind of a general base of where your strengths are and things that you want to make sure is an asset in your tool belt. I think that was kind of the biggest thing that I needed to know as someone who had no idea where I was going. Um, that was really, really helpful in terms of translating all of those becoming you competencies into something that was really applicable in a real world adult setting that I didn't really understand at the, at the time. Um, so that was very, very helpful for me. Excellent, thank you so much. Lexna, Cindy, who would like to go next? I could go. Um, okay. So I think like thinking back to when I was graduating, um, one of the things that I found really helpful was just um, taking stock of the interests I had and then sort of going after and seeking experiences that aligned with that. So I did a lot of um, volunteering around the arts and um, uh, just um, work within the South Asian community. And so just being able to explore that route, even though it wasn't directly related to, you know, um, uh, the degree that it was pursuing, uh, being able to connect with the people within those experiences actually helped me find other experiences that um, uh, were, were aligned with what I wanted to sort of explore. And so um, I guess that in a short, that's networking essentially, and also just um, exploring your experiences or, or the interests that you do have. Um, because ultimately, um, when you're interested in something and you're pursuing something that you're interested in, you're going to have a fulfilling career, right? So um, that's kind of the short tidbit of advice that I would share with the students that are graduating or are sort of exploring their interests, even though they're um, nearing the end of their uh, education or educational career. I don't know what the term for that is, but <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of what I would say. Great. Thank you so much. And Cindy? So for me, before I graduated, I made sure I took advantage of all the resources that the CD had. So I made sure I took advantage of the PACE program. And I also made an appointment with one of the advisors to have my cover letter and resume reviewed. And she really made, I, remember, I can't remember her name at the time, but she did make a point about my resume that I was listing the day-to-day -day task on my resume, but I should be listing the impact that I have left there. and she recommended that I try to quantify my experiences. Just because employers can quickly scan your resume and see the highlights really quick. So for example, if you can use percentages or how you save the company money, that would be really advantageous to the company. And I also recommend that you prepare your answers in the STAR format to the most commonly asked questions and then practice them with a trusted friend. Just because I find that on the spot, we usually stumble over our answers. And those would be the two tips that I have. 
Excellent tips. Thank you so much. I'm just about to add a resource into the chat. Um, you know, we've, we've mentioned a lot about workshops and individual appointments today, and that's fantastic. We encourage all of you to come take advantage of that. But in the meantime, if you are looking for something that is accessible 24-7, we have created some fantastic modules on our Moodle page as well. Uh, so whether it's resumes, learning about yourself, how to, how to gain on the job success, there's uh, resources there for you. Uh, so for our next question, um, I'd like to ask all of you just to provide some um, insights into what experiences proved to be the most beneficial to you when you were landing your first like real job after graduation um, or getting into further education, for example. And would you have done anything differently? All right, Cindy, why don't we start with you for this one? Oh, sorry, Cindy, your audio is off. <laughs> Thanks, Serena. So I mentioned previously, I strongly believe that my work study position helped me land my entry level career. And if I had known about campus jobs earlier in my degree, I think I would have pursued all of them. And even though I didn't become a teacher in the end, I'm still glad that I pursued my degree in education because I find that I would have had the what if thought, like what if I became a teacher? So doing the degree and experiencing placement, it made me to solidify my decision that it wasn't for me. Thank you so much. Althea, did you want to go next? Sure. Um, I think this is kind of a loaded question, Serena, and I think it's a great question too, because I think um, experiences really is about diversifying, right? There's no one experience that's going to give you, you know, the edge, although we all hope that there's kind of a band-aid that does that. But Generally, working for multiple uh, work city roles around campus really helped hone in my networking skills and my relationship building skills. I did a lot of volunteering with uh, clubs and student council, which helped me develop my leadership skills and my social skills. Um, and then I also did a lot of research work with Shulik, um, as well as uh, I volunteered with the president's ambassadors. So that's, that was a really cool program to be a part of. But even in those spaces, I was able to learn how to advocate for others and advocate for the student body. So I think in those roles, um, what was really advantageous about that was I was able to develop a broad um, kind of strategy or skill set that I was able to then apply into those roles. Um, and in terms of kind of what that meant for future leadership roles, so when I became, you know, an executive on council, I was then able to project manage a bunch of portfolios a lot better than I would have, right? I was able to you know, create an event like that. And it was just very kind of minute things that you wouldn't think would build into those pretty hard skills. Um, but then on top of all of those things, you learn how to think a lot, um, a lot more critically about kind of the experience of others around you, how to be a better team player. Um, and there's a lot of layers in that, right? And I think that's what helps improve those leadership skills. Um, in terms of what I would have done differently, that's the million dollar question uh, for students like Cindy and Lakshana and I. Um, but it's, I think for me, I would have, one, wished that I'd known that I love education as much as I do now. I was a psych student, right? So I had wished that I would have taken um, advantage of the go abroad opportunities on at York. I think we have so many opportunities and it always seems very daunting to move out and go away and step hugely outside of your comfort zone. So I'm still knocking my boots like, why didn't I do that? Um, and I think it's important that that adds a different layer of perspective, right? That we don't get in a Canadian context. And especially as we go into a more international world and we're seeing that we're doing all these things on Zoom, it's such an important asset as a professional to be able to speak to those different contexts and work with people from not your own geographic region, right? So that's something that I wish I had done. So if you haven't, go to a go to a, a workshop or a session. So I was going to put a link in the chat, I'm sure. Um, but that's what I wish I would have done differently. Thank you so much for that. I think that resonates with a lot of people because that's also something that I regret as well. Uh, Lexna. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, just to be able to reflect on um, the things that sort of help you get where you are today. Um, I think for me, uh, as I mentioned in a previous question, I was sort of figuring out how to, I guess, trans use my transferable skills in different places. And so um, what happened to me after graduation was I was actually, I jumped into more free freelance roles 
Um, and being able to do those things was allowing me to explore those different skill sets that I wanted to learn more about. Um, so whether it was like web design or graphic design or um, analyzing data, uh, learning how to write better. Um, through these different freelancing roles, I was able to further develop this skills that I uh, identified in the Becoming New program. And so I found that to be uh, really beneficial because now I'm in a role where I'm actually applying all of those different skills that um, I wasn't really boxing myself in to. Um, and like Althea said, uh, what would I have done differently? That's a great question. Um, I think this this goes back to while I was in school. I would have, if I if I had known better, I would have um, taken more um, electives that allowed me to explore those as well. Uh, just because um, in the fine arts programs, uh, I think there's a tendency to sort of just go into more arts related uh, courses, whereas there was the opportunity for me to explore um, courses in communications or courses um, that are relevant to what I'm doing today. Uh, so that's probably what I would have done differently. Another thing that I kind of wish I'd done, and I'm starting to do now, I guess, is connect with alumni um, that are doing things that I wanted to do uh, back when I was in school, which wasn't too long ago. Um, but uh, I was able to connect with an alumni from my program who was doing something completely different to what she was doing um, while she was in school. And that one conversation, it still sticks with me today. And I st I'm still in contact with her as well. But just being able to speak to someone who's sort of been through it already um, is like really eye-opening. And it sort of reminds you that uh, you're not limited to, you know, what you think you're limited to. Um, so. Yeah. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. Um, we've talked a lot about networking today, even in our employer panel, um, and, and all of you have kind of mentioned the role that networking played in your own journey. So we'd love to hear from you as, you know, all three of you kind of are recent graduates in many ways. Um, so what advice do you have for students when it comes to networking effectively, especially for those students that, um, you know, are nervous about the process or fearful about the process? Any, any advice would be great. Just feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in. Um, I can answer that. So uh, I was a really shy, nervous, um, just really anxious student. And um, the thought of reaching out to someone was just so dreadful to me. Um, of course, with the help of my Becoming You coach, Vaishnavi, she was like, no, you're great. You're, you're, you're confident. Um, you have a skill set that should be shared with other people. Um, and so when it comes, when it came to networking, it was more of a, just jump into it and see what happens. Cause you're not really losing anything by telling people what you're really good at or, um, offering, um, you know, the, the skill sets that you do have and also learning from them as well. Um, and once you get started by just connecting with people, even though you might come off as nervous, they might not see that, right? Um, it's uh, being able to present yourself in a way that is open and friendly. It, it's something that takes practice for sure, but once you actually get to it and you connect with people, you're gonna realize that we're just people, right? Um, and uh, we, we, we all feel that way in certain um, situations, but, uh, it's really about taking that jump and just trying to see um, where you where you land. So, thank you so much. Who would like to go next? I can oh, yeah. go next. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. So personally, I found myself, especially while I was an undergrad, in spaces where I had zero talking points with the people in the room and that was incredibly scary because they'd be speaking about things that I didn't even like understand the words that were coming out of their mouth um, and that was extremely intimidating um, I didn't even understand like where the common ground existed I'm like I don't even know if I should talk to you about your dog or Netflix or like the state of the world so <laughs> what I learned to do very quickly was to leverage my knowledge as a student and as a student leader um, and show that I had value and that I could add into those types of conversations. And people, especially at York, love to know what you're navigating and how you're navigating it. So if you're able to contribute in a meaningful way, um, you know, and say like, as a student, that was kind of my go-to, as a commuter student, as a first generation student, I had like plugged all of those things um, that was really helpful. And, and naturally those conversations 
you know, then were much more organic. And then you had a talking, you know, touch point base um, for a lot of the people that I found myself in, in these spaces with. Um, and then if that failed, I'm like, okay, what's the Netflix craze? Or, you know, I have a pet dog, here's my dog. And that was really helpful. But just generally learning how to uh, leverage your own experiences and provide value in that way was really helpful in terms of how to network. So I highly recommend that. Great advice, both of you. Cindy? So for myself, similar to Lesna and Alethea, I struggle with networking as well. So what I did was I took advantage of the network I had on campus. So I would network with my professors, my TAs, and my classmate. And that's actually how I landed the work study position through my classmate. And I know that when it comes to networking, the relationship can feel very transactional. Like you can feel like maybe this person thinks that I'm just using them to get a job. So what I found useful was just asking them, like, how can I help you with your projects? And trying to make it feel more equitable in that sense. And that would be my tip. Great advice, all three of you. Thank you so much. And I think it's such a you know, common, common things that so many students go through when it comes to networking and all the advice that you gave was fantastic. And what I really want to, you know, emphasize as well is one, you know, learning more about yourself, right? Getting to know yourself will make it easier to connect with people. But as you are making these connections, the top of mind might be that you want a job. And we all know that that's the end goal, but really getting to know people on a more genuine, authentic level will allow you to really understand what it is that, you know, where those connections are, whether it's cooking, whether it's dogs, whether it's Netflix, um, you know, where do you relate? And then you're able to actually make meaningful connections with individuals that will be long lasting as well. So fantastic advice. Um, so we're down to our last couple of minutes before we open up our student Q&A. Um, for our audience, if you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to start Start typing those into the chat now um, and I'm going to continue with one more question here. So uh, let's see which one we want to tackle. You you all provided such great information here. Okay, so what types of opportunities, and, and some of you have mentioned some tips already, but what types of opportunities would you recommend for students who want a journey such as yours? So that doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, the same career or industry, but just a similar journey and, you know, finding success in your job search. So um, any, any last final pieces of recommendations or advice that you haven't had the chance to mention yet? Feel free to just unmute yourself and jump right in. Cindy, go ahead. <laughs> sure. So for myself, since I do digital marketing, I found that um, there are a lot of free summits that are hosted by industry like Salesforce, Pinterest, and Adobe. And these summits is where they talk about their industry standards and trends, and they're free for the public to attend. They happen once a year, and they also have like one-off events too that are open to the public that you can take advantage of if you're looking to learn more about digital marketing. And I also recommend that you reach out to your inner circle to offer them social media services if you're looking to ex expand your portfolio. For example, when I was trying to get my feet wet, I reached out to my yoga studio and asked them if I can just create content for free for them. And that way I can just add my, their work to my portfolio. And I also helped my mom establish her Instagram presence when she was having a store opening. So I would say take advantage of your inner circle, take advantage of the people that are on your campus if you're trying to build more experience. Thank you, Cindy. And, and really creating your own opportunities as well, it seems like, which is fantastic. All right, who would like to go next? Althea, go ahead. Thank you. Cindy, I love, I love that you created your own opportunities. Um, such a great point. Something uh, that I suggest for people to have a journey such as mine, that sounds very pretentious to me, um, but I think it's, it, it is a journey that everyone can do, right? And it's, everyone, it's something that everyone can find for themselves. Um, and that really is at least what I think is to put yourselves in those spotlights where people can see your work and see your expertise. And that's something, you know, when we go back to things that we reflect on, that's something that I wish I had done way more as an undergrad because um, for those of you in zodiac signs, I'm a Leo, but I don't feel like a Leo because I don't like attention. I hate compliments and I don't like it when people spotlight me. It's very awkward and weird. You know, it gets weird for me. So in terms of what I would do differently is like 
embrace those spotlight moments, right? Like let people see where your strengths are. And even if it's at a conference, I know there's so many conferences where students can present their posters or their essays, just show what you've got, right? And those are, those are the moments where people are gonna see you and see your work. Um, and that's where you find those amazing networking opportunities. And I think as another aside, um, make and search for your mentors. I've never gone up to someone and like, you're going to be my mentor for life. But I think just pay attention to the folks in your life and in your circle. Um, and even your professors who really inspire you and make you want to be a better person. Those are the people that it's really important to make that connection and build that first rapport. Um, and perhaps they'll be your mentor for life. I, I've had tons of mentors in my life and I'm so lucky to have that because initially really it was like, oh my God, they're doing such cool things. Things, I want to be like that when I'm an adult. Um, and that's often how it started. And it's worked out so well, because those are the people that really push you to be a lot better and see things that are beyond your scope of, you know, reality or what you can even dream for yourself. And they tend to see those seeds um, in you before you even do. So definitely search and look for those mentors in your life. Great advice. Um, Althea, you may not feel like a Leo, but I think you are meant to be in the spotlight. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> you are oh my very, God. No, don't do this very, to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Extra boost of confidence. <laughs> okay. And who would like to go next? Yeah. Um, I think what Althea ended off with just um, being mindful and looking around you to see all the mentors that you do have around you that you might not um, have been aware of before. That's something that um, I was able to do for myself as well. And just, um, you don't really have to stick to one person, right? There's so much knowledge in each person around you. And um, you're, um, yeah, so I would just be, be mindful of that. Essentially what Althea said. Um, another thing that I found really helpful uh, while I was freelancing, but also uh, transitioning into this job was uh, don't screen yourself out of job applications that you think you might not be um, qualified for, because um, if you're able to really tailor your resume and your cover letter to prove that um, you do have a skill set that might be um, suited for a job that you, you really want to take on, um, just apply to it and see after tailoring your resume and after tailoring your cover letter, because um, you never know uh, what a recruiter is really looking for. And um, they'll be able to see your um, you know, your confidence uh, within the application that you do build for yourself. So yeah, uh, that's, those are a little, a, a couple of tidbits I would leave with students. Excellent, excellent tidbits. Thank you so much. So I wanted to now open the discussion up to our audience and see if there are any questions from, um, from our audience for our speakers today. I do have one last question, but I would love to hear from all of you and see, and, and if it's not a question and just a comment, you feel free to add that into the chat or raise your hand and, or unmute yourself. Give it a couple of seconds here. I just want to add on to what Lexna said about like talking yourself out of applying for job opportunities. So when I applied for Schulich, I was really hesitant because they wanted three years of experience. And I was a fresh grad, I didn't have any. I applied anyways. And at the end of my interview, the hiring manager revealed to me that he was going to hire me because I seemed nice <laughs> and I had a can-do attitude. So my tip for you is that, like they can teach you the skills, but they can't teach you your personality. So I feel like you should always entertain the thought, like what if it does work out, you know, when you're applying for jobs? And <laughs> that would be my little tip for you guys. Thank you so much, Cindy. That is um, such a fantastic thing to say and, and such an important thing to remember as well, that personality matters, right? No matter, no matter what kind of environment that you find yourself in. Um, okay, so I don't see any questions here. And I, I, I wanted to kind of go back to something that Althea mentioned. Um, oh, I do see one question here. Um, any mental health advice for new grads that are doing job search? Um, you know, COVID has been, um, job search in general is very stressful, but COVID has not made anything easier. So any, any advice for that? Feel free to jump in here. Oh, Cindy, I didn't know if you wanted to go. <laughs> you go ahead. You go first. I just, um, I think, so some context, I graduated well, or like at the beginning of the pandemic. So it was two years of just trying to find a job, right? And um, that's kind of where the freelancing came into. Um, something I wish I told myself 
then um, that I know now is that you do have a lot of time to sort of figure out, figure yourself out, um, right? Just be mindful that um, you could take, well, depending on your situation, of course, um, you might be able to take as long as you need to find um, what you're looking for. Um, and um, yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's a really heavy question to answer, but uh, that's kind of what I would take into mind right now. Take, take your time figuring out your career because ultimately that's kind of the time that you put in to the building that foundation is going to help you last in the long run. So uh, yeah, yeah, good question. Great, great advice, Saksa. Anyone else? So when I was doing my job search, um, I applied to like 50, 60 jobs before I actually landed a full-time position. And I feel like no one really talks about that. And I want you to remember that your worth isn't tied to your job or your title. And that, sorry, there's one more point that I want to make is that, and then if you're not happy in your current state, then chances are you won't be happy once you get your job. So I would say just embrace the journey, embrace the process. And like, I found that the more jobs I applied to, the better my resume got because I was taking keywords from all these different job postings make it better. So I feel like just the whole job search process is a learning experience and you'll just come out better at the end of it. Althea? I was just gonna add a tiny thing. And I think this is something that, especially as work study students that we never record our successes. And so, especially when it comes to applying for jobs, Everyone knows that model, right? Like what's the, what's the situation, task, and what is your result? What is the tangible um, data, right? And everyone's like, I don't have the data. So if I were, you know, you looking back now, I would have definitely recorded the successes, right? Even if that's something as small as being an executive on a club and your following count increased by 50% over the pandemic, because let's be real, everyone's taking more time on Instagram, right? So if that's your success, no matter how small it seems, that success is still a good bullet point for your resume. So make sure that your resumes are as um, data-driven. I think that's probably the worst way to describe it. Rena's probably cringing right now um, from the CED, but make sure that your resume has as many bullet points that you can really point to your tangible um, outcomes with, because that's something that was really lacking and that you never record and never think to record. So keep those in mind and keep um, tracking them as you go. And I should probably take my own advice because my resume definitely needs help too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so we have about two minutes left. We do have one more question in the chat here. And I was hoping that each of you can maybe give like a 30 second answer to this. Um, and, and this is a really real thing for a lot of our job seekers as well. How do you think positively and not get stressed out after many job rejections? I can speak to this. I think I have a pretty good example. And if you had asked me two years ago to share this, I never would have. Um, but I applied to grad school, so it's a little bit different. And I had applied to a school that was my absolute dream school. It had everything I wanted in a program, and I, I thought I was highly qualified. Um, and I got super hard rejected, like standard, no, you didn't make it. And I was absolutely devastated. My whole kind of identity just crumbled because everything that I thought that I had worked towards just didn't pan out the way that I wanted to. And I think that's similar, a very similar rejection and kind of identity crisis that you go through when you don't get into a job or a role that you thought you were really good for. So it really took a lot of soul searching to kind of just accept it and move on, but also just where was the lesson there, right? Like, where did I fall short? How can I learn from that rejection? And also where can I improve, right? Does that mean I have to beef up my volunteer experience or you know maybe I needed just a year or a semester to just re-figure out all of my skill sets and that was really important because especially when you're riding so many highs as a you know as for me I was a super keener so I was going super super high and I really needed that reality check to break me back down to earth in terms of what does the real world look like and how do I adapt and bounce back and become better um, in those situations, because those points can really make or break your confidence in yourself. And it's important that you kind of tune back in and reassess where, where things went wrong. 
Excellent points. Um, I am also not taking credit for what I added into the chat. I heard a speaker say this at a panel a couple of months ago, and it was just fantastic. But I th think that it really, um, it really relates to, you know, work study positions and becoming you as well. Any other points there before we end off our session today? Laksana, Cindy, yeah, go ahead. So for me, I just saw every rejection as like a redirection and that I was being protected from something that wasn't meant for me. So I thought that I wanted to be a, in a customer service role, but looking back now and hearing about my friends' experiences, like I'm glad that I got rejected from customer service roles. So yes, just think of it as a redirection. Great, thank you. Lexna? Yeah, I think what um, both uh, Cindy and Althea have said are really what I was thinking as well, um, especially what Cindy said about uh, being redirected. Um, in the moment while you're applying to something, it might seem like, oh yeah, this is the perfect role for me, but um, it's also good to just be open and, uh, and accept that re rejection is a part of life ultimately. Um, and also the feelings that come with it are something that um, it, it might be something that you want to avoid, but it's also important to um, accept those feelings as well and let it sit with you um, and uh, just let it, come and go, let it pass. Uh, and then again, how Althea mentioned that, um, uh, start from where you are and see um, uh, how you can improve upon yourself. Um, and it might be also helpful. It's something that I did when I was applying to jobs and also to um, uh, call for applications when I was a design or a freelance designer. Um, it, sometimes you can reach out and ask for, um, you know, how you could improve upon an application. You might not always like hear back uh, because recruiters and also people who assess applications don't really have the time for that. But um, on the rare chance that you do get advice back, then you, that's kind of a golden nugget in the rejection sort of. So um, yeah. Yeah. Excellent advice, all three of you. Thank you so much. So this brings us to the end of today's panel. Panel, uh, not the end of the session though, so please stick around. Our intention for today's session was really to provide you with an opportunity to not only connect with your alumni, but also hear from individuals who held work study positions in order to gain advice and insights about how you yourself can identify, recognize, and articulate your own transferable skills. Uh, so we trust that you found this information valuable. And again, if you have any questions about career education and development resources, you can always uh, message me directly. If you can please join me in thanking our panelists for being here today. Uh, um, you were amazing. And as I mentioned before, and I want to say this again, we are just so, so, so proud of you. So thank you for allowing us to be part of your journey. Um, and thank you for joining us today. Yvette, back to you. Thank you. Wow. I am incredibly touched by our alum. You are, they are all incredibly bright lights. Whether they're continuing their careers, doing very important roles here at York, and two of them are, or elsewhere, it's very clear that they've made those connections. Um, also, an important takeaway that I'm going to note is it's, you know, from what I heard from them, it's completely okay to start with the career in mind, choose an academic program, and realize upon reflection that it's not right for you and establish a new plan. I'm very aware that for many of our students, that feels probably a bit unsettling, given that you've got expectations for yourself and also the realities of what your friends and family are expecting of, of you. But it's really important, I think, to normalize this is really about a career journey and not a race. And the journey takes us in different directions. And so all, all, also all of us you know, at York who are working with our incoming or current students, that we need to take that to heart and take the pressure off our students or encourage them to take the pressure off themselves that they pick one path and stay on it. Our alumni panel make me really proud, both as a fellow alum, but also as someone who's working in the division of students. And I love that they were so open and transparent about their times in their careers and studies where they weren't always feeling so sure and feeling a bit nervous. I think for any of us watching and listening to the panel, it's very clear that they come across uh, in, this, in this event as huge successes, super confident and really knowledgeable. But I think it's really important for, that, for us to know that they didn't always feel that and that there are moments they, that just being Cuban, that they needed to reflect and take some pause. And it's, it's also in those moments that we learn and grow. So I wanna, really signal that to, to any of our students that are joining us today that, yes, at a, an event like this, you know, absolutely um, their success and their confidence really shows, but it's, 
it's not 100% of the time, 24 seven, we all have those moments where we need to reflect upon that. So that's wonderful. Now, moving along uh, uh, with our with our agenda. Now, it's something very exciting, Coach of the Year. I know the Academy Awards and the Canada's World Cup uh, qualifier, of which we are going, just happened this past weekend. But we've got some very exciting awards to hand out to. And it's my pleasure to announce our 2021-22 Coach of the Year. And while we don't have a red carpet or a virtual red carpet, our Coach of the Year is always someone who's just as special. I'm told that there are quite a few contenders, but the individual chosen, as we can see on the screen now, ex exemplifies how it, what it means to support work study experience and combine that with personal growth and the development of work skills. It is my absolute pleasure to recognize our colleague, Tina Ranta, who is the Assistant Director of Wellbeing and Student Counseling, Health and Counseling and Wellbeing. Tina has been described by many in, in, in ways that you can see on the screen as kind and caring and often finding ways to connect work study students with individuals and opportunities and helping all members for team feel valued. I'd like to turn it over to Tina to share a few words and congratulations, Tina. Thank you so much. Um, what an amazing event. I just, and I, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction. And I just wanted to share that. Um, so I began at York in February of 2021 during uh, this into a new job, into my first remote environment job of working, um, where I've been used to being so much more connected with people, um, in which there was some barriers and some new possibilities to work out and connecting with people. So my role was a newly created role at the university to support enhancing student well-being on campus. And navigating a new environment in a virtual world was not an easy feat, but I'm so grateful um, that I've had the opportunity to see many more students in face since we started this winter term. Um, so through that journey, some of my first interactions with students at York were through um, new well-being um, work study positions attached to my role. And it has been such an honor working alongside such brilliant and driven students and helping planning, enhancing, and visioning what well being looks like and can look like on campus. Um, so, through Becoming You program, I was able to support uh, students in learning new skills, reaching their goals, and also creating new work and learning experiences for more students on campus. Um, so with the support of the work study students I had a privilege of working with this year, we were able to um, successfully create a student-led well-being podcast that we're planning to bring to fruition over this summer through three additional work study positions and also build in work study positions to support the creation and ongoing support and engagement plans for a future pan-university well-being strategy. So I'm just going to throw a plug out there as well, too. We are recruiting for those positions. So uh, if you yourself are a student that are passionate about well-being, or if you know some students that are passionate about well-being, please feel free to contact me or uh, forward uh, them onto those applications. So having student voice and experience is so integral to enhancing well-being at York. Um, and also the well-being of our whole community. So I'm excited that in the future, we will bring uh, those well-being focused student opportunities at York to fruition to be able to support some of this important work. Um, and then just lastly, I wanted to give a big thank you to Jennifer and Shukriya for nominating me for this honor. I feel so grateful uh, to have had the opportunity to work with these two brilliant students over the past <laughs> few terms in creating opportunities for students to promote and enhance well-being. It has been such a privilege and their perspectives and contributions have really been central at making these big dreams into the reality of what we're looking at moving forward to in the future. So um, I really look forward to being able to continue coaching more students and my whole time being here, it's been a lovely experience. And um, I hope that's something I'm able to continue on in my journey here at York. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tina. And I did not realize that you are a new colleague. So special congratulations. Um, it's, it's like, yeah, what are those awards, you know, where it's like the one to watch or the the um, what's the Grammy Award for you know a, a new a new artist? So if we had that, that that would be you. And 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 congratulations for for stepping into the role you know as a new colleague, um, stepping into the role and doing it so well. So on to our next award. Very exciting! Wow, I feel like I'm like this is like the Academy Awards, but unlike the Academy Awards and the World Cup, where there could only be one winner, 
we can actually do things differently here. And in this year, I understand it was impossible to pick only one student for the Work Study Student of the Year Award. So we decided to award to two very deserving individuals. I'd like to congratulate Julia Romano and Raven Lovering, who both can be described as often going above and beyond. Julia is a work study uh, student in the Dean's office in the LAMPS, and she works to support experiential education. Her nominator notes that she contributes actively to her team, offering insights as a student and keeping the needs of students at the center of her work. Raven's position is in learning skill services, where she plays a big role supporting students' transition and the development of their learning skills that really contribute to their student success. Her nominator, her nominator describes her as always putting her best effort forward and always eager to contribute. Congratulations to Julia and Raven. We are right on time here. Wow, this, is, so basically this wraps up, uh, that we've got a couple of honorable mention, mentions as well. Michelle Thomas and Kat, Kat, Katarina Blair, who, and also some of the other nominees. So I wanna give hats off to our additional honorable uh, mentions. And thank you for all of the folks who put forward nominations. This is really important as well. This I think wraps up our event uh, and an exciting year end celebration. Hats off to our work study students for jobs well done. I also want to thank our campus partners and colleagues here today, especially those of you who played instrumental roles supporting the work study program and our students. All, all of you, along with our students, whether working online or in person where you could, have made really important contributions to York services and operations, and more importantly, the university as a caring and strong community. Thank you also to Lucy Fromowitz, our Vice Provost students, for her remarks, and for whom this will be her final year-end celebration as she prepares for retirement in a few months. She has been an absolute champion of work integrated learning and for supporting York students with vibrant and enriching learning experiences both in and outside the classrooms. And a final absolute big thank you to the team at the Career Education and Development. It's been a pleasure to get to know Bob and his team to work with Rena and Serena and others over the past few months since I've started in, this, in December of last year. They put a lot of careful thought into our work study program and how do we can support students along their learning journey and career development journeys with, with becoming you and work study and making this event an absolute success. I really look forward to joining you next year for another great event.